Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am here again with an author interview for you to enjoy. I am working on getting everything caught up, but I am very blessed to have had so many author interviews and to be able to continue doing them even while I've been home for... September, I was actually supposed to be leaving in a couple of days to go back to California, but um, f- my husband and I had all originally talked about maybe me staying a little bit longer since my dad just started chemo and I want to see how how he's doing with that process. But then a dear friend of my family died and her children asked me to do the funeral. So I will be staying for that because the funeral isn't until September 18th. So I am now staying longer than I had originally planned, which is okay. I miss my husband terribly. I miss my puppies and my dragons, but it's it feels right to be home and to be doing this for a family that is my family as well. So grateful for that and grateful to be able to continue to record interviews maybe not at the greatest sound quality um with my uh, with with the speakerphone on my parents phone but still recording interviews and still getting to spend time in this uh hilarious studio that I have created in my bedroom with the giant teddy bear so today I am speaking with author Mark Leslie a Canadian author I mentioned at the end of the last in a, uh, episode that this is the first book in another series, a fantasy series featuring a shifter main character. It is uh, the Canadian Werewolf series, and this one's called A Canadian Werewolf in New York. Again, the author is Mark Leslie, and let me go ahead and read the back for you. Alpha Wolf, Beta Human, Big Apple. Michael Andrews seems to have it all. He's a successful author and a minor celebrity living in Manhattan. It's a pretty big step up from his humble Canadian upbringing. Of course, his lycanthropy poses a bit of a challenge. After waking up from his latest night of howling at the moon, he's naked, he's got a bullet hole in his leg, and he has a sneaking suspicion he ran into another wolf last night. A wolf that was stomping all over his home turf. If he's going to make an evening talk show appearance to promote his latest book, he'll need to figure out what happened to the previous night, oh, excuse me, what happened the previous night without letting his occasional heroics sidetrack him. Standing in his way are an agent, an ex-girlfriend, a variety of goons, and a fellow wolf encroaching on his territory. It's just another day in the life of a polite, small-town Canadian trying to stay alive in the Big Apple. You get a really good idea of the of the the book through that that description because you do have this, you know, polite Canadian human who just happens to turn into a wolf, not um a werewolf, but an actual wolf uh, around the full moon and he is a a wolf in the city of New York, which I can only imagine has other interesting um Interesting things that would happen to you. Uh, He wakes up naked, of course, because your clothes don't shift with you. What I like about this is that I read a lot of paranormal romance, and the shifters in those books, especially if they're wolf shifters, tend to be, you know, very alpha male in human form as well. And I love that this description says alpha male beta wolf, or alpha wolf, excuse me, beta male. He's, He's just this really sweet, kind, caring human during the day and I'm not saying that those alpha males aren't those things either but he's a little bit bumbling (laughs) he makes mistakes he's not this like "Mm, take charge he's just a 
I love him as a character and I enjoyed spending this day with him. It is just over the course of one day. So a day in the life of a New York, a Canadian werewolf living in New York as he's trying to get to a talk show appearance and everything keeps sidetracking him. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a brief description. Let's go ahead and turn to the conversation so that Mark can tell you more about the book and the series. Uh, Again, the author is Mark Leslie. The title of the book is A Canadian Werewolf in New York. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Sarah. Great to chat with you. It's wonderful to have you here. We're going to talk about your novel, A Canadian Werewolf in New York. Before we get to the book, though, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about yourself, I would appreciate it. Sure. My name is uh, Mark Leslie. I am a Canadian writer of mostly speculative fiction, which kind of means I I was attracted to the weird, the bizarre, the paranormal in my writing. And uh, I ended up calling it horror because it didn't quite fit with science fiction and it didn't quite fit with, you know, epic fantasy and dragons and, and, and swords and all of those things and magic. So, so I've always just called it horror, but I realized in, in many ways it may be considered urban fantasy. It may be considered paranormal, but I'd always been attracted to that. So I, I have a number of books out one of which, uh, several of which are uh, what I call true or tales told as true ghost story books based on locales, uh, haunted hospitals. Uh, I've got a book on haunted bookstores and libraries, as well as different cities like Ottawa, Canada's capital, capital and um, Hamilton, where I lived for a long time, and, and Sudbury, a um, city where I grew up in. So I've got those nonfiction books as well as some um, uh, lots of collections of, of you know weird tales, uh, short stories, and Twilight Zone style adventures, and so that's the majority of the, the I guess what I focus on as a writer. All right, thank you for that. Yeah, there's always that fine line between kind of horror, supernatural, fantasy. Where does it where does it fall? Um, I am not a huge horror fan, so I would say it's more urban fantasy, just for my own comfort level. <laughs> <laughs> fair um, enough fair enough and that's what i realized it's actually those terms are marketing terms that publishers created so people could know where to go in a bookstore right <laughs> so exactly. yeah and they can put people off too yeah and and there are novels that are multi-genre novels and so where do you put those exactly well that's the benefit of the digital world because they can be in multiple places at the same time yes they can so again, the book is A Canadian Werewolf in New York. Can you give an overview of the story? In a nutshell, it is about a man who is a uh, an alpha wolf and yet a beta human. So he's obviously he's cursed with lycanthropy and he turns into a wolf, an actual wolf. Um, the, not, a, not a man wolf, but an actual wolf form for the about 10 days uh, per month during the cycle of the full moon when it's at you know 80% or higher and he has no conscious awareness of um what the time when he's a wolf so he often finds himself in a situation where he wakes up and he has no idea what happened the night before now he does have brief clips and snippets of memories and smells and and sensations uh so he can kind of piece together some of what happened but uh he is an alpha wolf, but a beta human. So he is a Canadian. He's a pushover. He is um, a Boy Scout by nature. Very, very much, um, very much a polite, apologetic Canadian living in one of the largest cities in the world, in Manhattan, and then trying to deal with the side effects of being a wolf. And so it's it's got a lot of humor. Uh, there are, there are a lot of humor tendencies such as, you know, like where, what, what happened this time? I woke up naked in Battery Park with a bullet hole in my leg. What happened last night? Oh no, yet another mystery that for me to have to figure out. And that's kind of, that's kind of the basis of, of that novel and the rest of the series. Well, and I really like that about, uh, the character because he is, he's such a nice guy. <laughs> he tries really hard to be <laughs> And nice, and uh, you, you mentioned Stan Lee and Spider Man a lot throughout the novel, and he—I feel like uh, the character Michael is definitely trying to live up to that sort of superhero status in his own very nice Canadian sort of way. 
Yeah, for sure. And, and, and there's obvious nods to my love, obviously, as you can probably pick up on of, of Stanley and Spider-Man and great power uh, with great power comes great responsibility and all those elements. So yeah, that really drives Michael, but on top of it, even more so he's that Canadian bumpkin from a small town who is just a little bit of a misfit in, in a major uh, city like that, but uh, still doing his best to make his way. Yes. Can you talk about your initial inspiration for the series? Yeah, so it actually all started off, it was a short story. Uh, I had been, uh, I did a lot of short stories when I was uh, early on in my writing career, and I would look at markets, and there was a market call for an anthology, I think that was supposed to be called The Beast Within. And the editor was looking for stories about the human side of monsters. So they wanted the human, not the monster. So if there was a, you know, Jekyll and Hyde or any of the, any of those things, they wanted to, to see the human and not, not that monster. So I thought, Hey, wouldn't it be neat to write a story about a guy who wakes up and I happened to have just visited New York for the first time, you know, walking through battery Park and just thinking, wow, imagine waking up here naked bullet hole in your leg, taste of human blood in your mouth because you, you know, you're a werewolf and you have no idea what happened the night before, what would you do? Uh, how would you get close? How, where, where would you go? How would you figure you know, so nobody sees you as you're trying to figure out how to get back home uh, and, and, and actually make it to an appointment. And so that became sort of this story called This Time Around. It was about 10,000 words. It overshot the market by 5,000. So I think I, I, I had a version where I cut it down, I sent it to the market, it got rejected. But a good friend of mine, Sean Costello, who is a, a horror and thriller writer himself, he read it and he went, wow, I really like this. What happens next? And I said, nothing. It's over. It's just this, the whole point is that he got to his appointment and you just realize this is a slice of life of what this guy is like, what most mornings are going to be like for this poor guy. And he kept asking the question of what happened next. And, and I thought about it and I went, well, why is it so urgent that he get to a uh, meeting with his agent? So what I decided to do was for the novel, as I wanted to expand it, the agent has something really cool that he's going to tell him. He is to be a guest on David Letterman. He happens to also be a writer himself. And so there was a last minute cancellation. And, you know, writers are always so desperate for for uh, uh, for appearing on something. So the agent got him in a last minute fitting so he could be on uh, the Letterman show, which is uh, filmed during daylight hours, by the way. So the whole course of the novel is Michael as a human between the hours of when the sun goes down. Uh, or when the sun comes up and the sun goes down. And so I wanted, I thought the novel, I thought it would be fun to say, okay, yes, you're going to see snippets and clips and, and kind of get a bit of a, because there was a bit of a mystery of what happened. There was another wolf involved, and that's part of the mystery is he's trying to figure it out. And so that was kind of the basic premise for the novel. What if I showed the whole day of this guy as a human dealing with the side effects of a werewolf? And and again, this is where, you know, Stan Lee and Spider-Man and superheroes come in is that as a human, he has enhanced powers. He has enhanced senses, enhanced strength. And therefore, uh, especially during the, the cycle of the full moon. So he uses these powers and sense to detect that other people need help. He can hear things. He can pick up on things. He can sense heartbeats and stress and all the different emotions that, you know, a dog might feel or a wolf might be a sense off of us. Well, we're, most of us are probably more familiar with the canines in our homes as opposed to the ones in the wild. But uh, it was based on a lot of that. And so even like characters like Daredevil and Wolverine who have those enhanced um, uh, those enhanced powers. So Michael uses those to help other people. And that, of course, gets him into some uh, diversions and ex escapades and, um, and tangents that kind of throw his day off a little bit. Time for our first break of the podcast, but you can see a little bit about how Michael's character is that very kind, considerate uh, Canadian that I was talking about at the beginning of the episode. And Mark and I will be talking about that more when we come back. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Hey, it's Sarah here to tell you about the Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all in one dryer brush. I just took this traveling with me and it is amazing in that it is a three in one tool. I didn't have to pack extra equipment with me just for my hair on this trip. 
It has a hair dryer. It is a volumizer. It is a detangler. It can do all of these things in one step. The large oval brush creates glam, waves, the bristles painlessly remove knots as you dry and style. It uses ionic technology to create a frizz-free look effortlessly. Speaking of that frizz-free look, there are three heat settings plus a cool setting that will lock in your look for effortless looking hairstyles. It's got a bonus volumizing attachment included that gives you added lift at the roots and the removable attachments make storage at home or away super easy. Like I said, I just traveled with it and it was so easy and so convenient. If you would like your very own Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all-in-one dryer brush, simply go to conair.com and search dryer brush. Again, that is conair, C-O-N-A-I-R.com and search dryer brush. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, my interview with Mark Leslie and a discussion about what are, could arguably be the politest werewolf you'll, or the politest wolf shifter you may ever meet. So let's get back to that interview. Yes, and while he is very helpful, it doesn't always work out quite the way he wants. So <laughs> that, that's part of the yeah, humor. Yeah, like he's mistaken. Yeah, he's mistaken for tries to save a baby because he thinks the baby's being kidnapped, <laughs> and then he gets uh, accused of being, a, you know, trying to um, trying to steal a child from a toddler from the mother. So yeah, he he does sometimes um, make mistakes because he misinterprets things. Yes. Uh, which is, I think, part of definitely for me. That's part of his appeal. He's a he's a very likable character. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you think about Michael will resonate with readers? I think people will like the the fact that he wants to do good. Uh, but like many of us, you know, we often, you know, we start out, we don't start off our days thinking, how can I ruin someone else's day? We often start with really good intentions, and sometimes. You know, even with good intentions, we can make mistakes. And and he's um and he's fallible. Um, he is also he encounters um uh this ex girlfriend uh, of his who comes back into his life because she needs his help because she knew that he was a werewolf, uh, and he always thought it was a you know he was keeping it such a good secret. But she also works in the occult, and so she picked up on enough clues that she had figured it out. Um, but the fact that he had lied to her and hadn't shared that he was a werewolf was like uh, evidence that, you know, he didn't trust her enough. Therefore the relationship ended. So, but she comes back and needs his help because her fiance is missing and, and she knows that he could potentially, you know, scent and track the guy down. So he tries really hard to help her because he still, he realizes he still loves her desperately. So he's trying to help her find her fiance, even though he's like the last thing he would want is to find her fiance because he wants her back. Um, and so he ends up uncovering other things along the way. And, and I think, I think there's, there's, there's a bit of innocence that people can see in themselves, uh, in Michael. And, and then, there, and then there's the mistakes, uh, and the regrets that we all have, uh, that Michael experiences through the course of, of even just this single novel. And I think for some reason, people resonate with that. The other thing I think that people enjoy and, and this is part of him being a bumbling, polite Canadian, is that oftentimes, and because the, the book is narrated first person perspective from Michael, so you're in his head and you're hearing his thoughts. And he is very sardonic and sarcastic 
and he mocks people and makes fun of them, and he has nicknames for different people because of their body odor or any of the weird things about them uh, that he can pick up on. But he doesn't often say those things aloud because he's too polite. <laughs> but you know he's thinking something. And the other thing that, uh, and, and this is something I learned from uh, uh, Jeff Elkins, the dialogue doctor who kind of helped me with this, is when he gets nervous, he's funnier because he lets some of those sarcastic things slip. And that actually helps him because it, um, the people he's you know maybe fighting with are not expecting him to be joking. And that kind of throws them. So there's a little bit of that nervous tension that he has. Because, again, he wasn't born to be a superhero. He's just an average an average guy. Yep, just, yeah, exactly. Uh, so in terms of your character development, do you like to do, do you like to have a really good sense of a character before you start writing or does your character develop as you write? I think Michael developed as I wrote him. So as I, as I wrote him and he woke up and he realized what was going on, I, the things he did kind of told me who he was. Uh, and uh, some of the silly things he has to do, like he finds a discarded pair of, of panties and he has to put them on because it's the only clothes he can have. And, and all of the things that he encounters along the way and, and the conversations he may have with like um, a homeless lady where he actually has to bargain with her because he wants a shirt from her from her collection and she wants something else he has. So there's he he developed uh, organically as I was writing the short story. And then the novel, I actually reflected on a little bit more about his background and then any of the characters that come along. Some of them I have an idea up front what they're going to be and 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 whatever. But in in other cases, what happens is they and, and I love this as a writer. I put them in a situation, I put them in a setting, and they just start interacting with one another, and they can really surprise me. It actually happened with a character in 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 the next uh, book in that series where she was just meant to be a plot device. And I fell in love with her. She was a you know a book nerd, and she was really bright. And Michael and her just got along so well that I just kept writing dialogue because I wanted to see what they would say to one another. And then they be, they struck up this really unique sort of you know, mentor uh, father daughter type uh, friendship because uh, she's rather young and he's very protective of her because that is uh, part of his wolfish nature is that that pack protection. Uh, elements. And that's happened to me so many times where characters just organically grew on their own. And I think when you can do that as a writer, it's one of the most wonderful experiences because the the characters seem to become, it almost seems magical. They seem to become real as you, as you write them. Uh, and then you can, sometimes I will outline uh, details about their lives that I think are pertinent. But then they inform me through the course of the story that that's not who they really are, and so I can uh, I can have an outline, but I'm I'm flexible to adjust it as as the character sees fit, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. I I love that that you just kind of let them develop on their own um, within within some frameworks, I would imagine. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think it is about this genre of horror? supernatural, urban fantasy, whatever you want to call it. What what about that draws you to writing in that genre? I think the thing that the common element that draws me in is the question of what if that comes with that uh, supernatural or speculative fiction. What if this were to happen? So in Michael's case, what if a guy, um, you know, bumbling plate Canadian had... Um, the curse of lycanthropy and was living in one of the biggest cities in the world. How would he deal with the side effects of that? And so most of the things I've loved to read and love to write happen to involve what if. So it's usually near real uh, time and space. And then I kind of play with it. And, and, and I find that such an intriguing playground because you can go so many different ways with, with a what if. Um, that what if question could have gone different if the character was not the character of Michael Andrews. If he was a different character, that would be a completely different story. And that's the, to me, that's the thrill and joy of, um, of that sort of uh, genre. Yeah. Thank you for that. Did you do any particular type of research for this book? 
Yeah, I've actually had to do a lot. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, I was inspired on my first trip to New York. I just fell in love with the city. Again, I grew up in a small town of 2,000 people, so it was like nothing I had ever seen, even compared to you know Toronto, Ontario, uh, Canada's largest city. New York's just that way, way bigger uh, in, 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 in every way, shape, and form. So I, I, several trips to New York uh, helped inform uh, the writing and rewriting uh, of this novel over the years. Google Maps was a, a wonderful resource because I really had to logistically figure out how Michael was going to get from point A to point B. Uh, I did a lot of research on the cycles of the moon because it's set in a particular year. I think it's 2004. 14 or 15, I can't remember. <laughs> but I had to go back and say, okay, it's August X, and this is the day of the full moon, and that. And so a lot of um, a lot of research on that to make sure I got it accurate. I wanted to make sure I got details accurate, so somebody who lives in the city or is very familiar would know. Uh, so it might even be things like, oh yeah, this cafe is here, or it takes this long to walk from here to here. A lot of those research elements were important. Researching wolf, um, wolf behavior and understanding. Again, I'm making up the fact that what would his senses be as a human? Like, why would he have them? So I had to create that and make it up. But it was based on it was based on things that I learned about the wolf. And then, of course, you have to research the werewolf mythology enough to know what kind of werewolf you want it to be. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there are some wolves where they're humanoid forms and, and they're consciously aware. And then there's other wolves that just transform into a wolf, but they're still human conscious. And so I kind of had to research enough about werewolves to know what kind of werewolf I wanted Michael to be. Um, and so that was uh, that was uh, evident. Even I, I remember one, there's a scene where he's racing down these stairs uh, and then somebody's waiting for an elevator in a high rise um, building. And trying to figure out the average pace of the average person, plus add that Michael's, you know, superpower speed a little bit so he can run a bit faster than the average person. And would he be able to make it down whatever is it, 21 flights <laughs> faster than the elevator would take to get to the right floor and bring the people down? Things like that were uh, logistical. Uh, him going in David Letterman. Fortunately, I'd, I'd, I'd been in the audience of uh, David Letterman show of a taping, so I was familiar with that. And I even had a friend. I was really, I was really pleased. I had a friend who had worked backstage uh, for the Letterman Show for a number of years. And when she read it, she was one of my early readers. She said, "Have you worked backstage at Letterman? Because you nailed it. You got this down pat." And I said, "Well, you know, I've been, I've been in the audience. I kind of, I'm, I'm aware. I'd worked in theater for a number of years, and I've been backstage in a number of TV." Uh, studios over the years, you know, as a, as a writer and industry person. And so I was familiar enough with what it was like backstage and what was going on and all of the stage management and all of the moving pictures and strings back there that I just, in, you know, kind of blended some of my own experiences into that and fictionalized it. But I'm so glad to hear I did it in a way that actually convinced somebody who had worked there that I that I was that familiar with, with it. That's that to me is a, a sign of really good research. Well, and I'm impressed with your attention to detail in that. Um, I looked up the Algonquin Hotel because I wasn't sure if you know it was <clears throat> a real hotel or one that you had made up. And um, as I was looking through pictures, there is an actual hotel cat <laughs> named Matilda. Yeah. Um, I yeah. Uh, and books on Matilda. Uh, the, the other thing too is I'd stayed at the Algonquin several times, and I love going there for drinks. Uh, for cocktails, actually, for martinis specifically. And so, yeah, the Algonquin is a character in and of itself. I mean, such if you ever get a chance, it's such a phenomenal place. And, and again, I want, I'm so glad that it was such a place that you were interested in it to see if it was real or I just made it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, did you set the book in 2014 for a specific reason or was it kind of when you wrote that or the initial short story and it evolved from there? I initially I started writing this novel in 2006. Um and then I updated the dates as I was rewriting it. So uh the rewrites I, I was re the majority of the rewriting took place cuz I put it aside for a long time. And and it was in 2014. So what I had to do is I had to pick the 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 cycle of the moon and the schedule. It was again it was a date, so I had to pick a date. 
But then I also wanted it to be a bit more realistic. The other thing is uh, Letterman retires, uh, you know, in reality later. So I had to be while he was still uh, while he was still um, uh, active. And so I couldn't set it back as far as 2006. I wanted to be a little bit closer because the very first version of this book was published in 2016. And and so I, I, I kind of maintained that um, I had some logistical uh, things related to, you know, when construction was happening down here, Battery Park and um, um, and the ferry that's uh, the Staten Island ferry that's down there. So I, I needed it to be realistic based on when I had been there, what I had experienced, because as we know, things change so rapidly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm writing a, a writing a book set now and having him go on Letterman when Lever when Letterman is not on the air anymore would be a little uh, disconcerting. <laughs> People go, wait a second, he retired four years ago. <laughs> right, right. Um, Time for the second break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about autobiographical elements within the series. So stay tuned and find out if Mark is actually a wolf shifter and that's why he's writing the series. We'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Mark Leslie. We are discussing his Canadian Werewolf series and the first novel in that series, which is called A Canadian Werewolf in New York. Do you have autobiographical elements in your in, in your writing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, a good, a good portion of Michael's often starts off with how I might react in a situation. Mm -hmm. um, but then, of course, he's a lot stronger uh, and able to do things. Um, I mean, he's stronger em emotionally <laughs> and, and mentally um, than I am braver and, and, and all those things. So there are some autobiographical auto, um, um, natures. Obviously, he's a writer, so it was easy for me to go, OK, this is this is what I know about the writing business. And even and even uh, other characters are very autobiographical because they often start. They may be based on on people I know. Uh, and then, or based on a composite of three or four people, uh, or or uh, other thing, other elements like that. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't think a writer can really avoid that. Now, what I don't want to do is just write. Like Michael Andrews is not me, although Michael Andrews is a Canadian like me. He is a pushover like me. He may look like an alpha at times. You know, he's a, a tall, dark, handsome man. Uh, but he's really meek and mild mannered, so the look, looks are, can, can be a little bit deceiving, similar to myself. But I think that's a basis for characters, and it's not everything about them. And, and, and to me, it's important that that he has to be his own character, and all of the other characters have to be their own. There are so many people in 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 Michael's universe that were based on real people. Uh, his his agent, for example. Actually, I, uh, his name came from a nod from one of my early readers as a sort of a thank you for the help he gave me. So um, 
uh, Mac, uh, Mac the Knife Halpin is, you know, Mick Halpin, uh, a writer from uh, Ireland who was one of my early readers and, and he offered all kinds of great suggestions. So I was like, I'm going to, a little nod to you is, is I'm going to name a character after you. But again, Mac Halpin is not Mick in any way, shape or form except for the name. Uh, and then, of course, there's other elements of other of other characters and people I've encountered that kind of went into building that character. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, the um, Irish writer is a little bit nicer than Mac. Not that he's not nice, but he's <laughs> very oh, no, blunt. Mac, Mac is a, a bit of a jerk. Yeah, no, no, and that and that's part of the, the he's a, a, a foible character. But no, 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 the the real the real Mick uh, is is an awesome guy. <laughs> Has never yelled at me the way that uh, uh, Mac yells at Michael. Excellent. I'm glad to hear it. Um, do you have a, an arc in mind for the series, or is this something that you just want to write as long as Michael keeps, um, you know, speaking to you in some way? Yeah. So it was funny when I I, I wrote Canadian Werewolf in New York, and it was just meant to be uh, a novel. I thought it would be fun. Um, and then I had enough uh, people who had read it who said, well, I'd love to see what happens. Like, what happens with Gail, this woman he loves? Because I kind of left it unresolved. That it was like, and we'll see what happens kind of thing. And uh, and then I thought, well, okay, if this is just typical of one day in his life, what other things could have happened to him? So I ended up picking up the story. And, and, and again, the next novella, I think right now there's only – Technically, four books uh, in the series. I've got a novella uh, called Stowaway, where he's on a train heading to Stowe, Vermont, um, trying to keep a young girl safe. I call it um, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles meets Logan, uh, for people to kind of understand what this is about. And um, and then the next full-length novel, um, you know, it's technically book two in the series, Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, where he goes to L.A. to be on the movie set to work um, on the movie set of one of the one of his books that's being made into a film, thanks to his agent. Uh, and then and then the, the, the book that's coming out very soon uh, in December 2021 is uh, Fright Night's Big City, where he returns back to New York. But uh, some stuff that happened in L.A. is um, uh, some bad stuff. And the bad guys in L.A. Uh, end up coming uh, following uh, and, and bringing some evils uh, to New York. And so I was only intending on having sort of standalone adventures that you could kind of pick up, and you still can read them. But even uh, with Between Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, when I realized I was already 70,000 words into writing the first draft of that book, and I realized it was not going to be able to resolve the overarching big story arc with these really uh, incredible bad guys I created. So what happened was I, uh, I decided I would do a resolve the immediate urgencies that happened, but I couldn't resolve the big, big picture. So there is a bigger story arc that starts in fear and longing in Los Angeles and continues through, uh, to fear and longing or fright nights, big city. And then there is a larger story arc of that. I call it the I'm I'm an old Cheers TV show fan. I call it the Sam and Diane element um, that you find so commonly in fiction. You saw it in Lucifer for the several several seasons of the Lucifer TV series. You saw it in Castle, and that's where the the two main care. And you see it in so many other TV shows uh, and movies where the the two main characters obviously are attracted to one another, but for some reasons they just can't get together Mm -hmm. and the tension of them not being together. And so that's the thing I created with Michael and Gail that, uh, that I'm having, I mean, I'm having fun with, I'm not toying with people's emotions, but (laughs) readers are like, I just want to see them get together. What are you doing to me? And so I'm drawing, I'm drawing that out in a, in an interesting, what I think is an interesting way. And the readers seem to, to resonate with it. So I've got a bunch of sort of story arcs related to that, but I actually have no idea how long it's going to go for. Um, because again, I haven't, I still haven't finished the first draft of Fright Night's Big City. I, I, I know roughly how it's going to end, but what happens next and where Michael can go and what things can happen are are still up in the air. And, and I love that. And I've also left, uh, I've purposely left time between books because I have written short stories that uh, some are finished, some are not finished, where I actually explore something that happened between this book and that book. Because he will have days 
very often where he wakes up not knowing how he got there, what he did the night before. And that's kind of part of the, um, that's sort of part of the mystery that he has to deal with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you think he will return to Canada during the series? I think I have to bring him back home. I, that, I think that would be fun for him, especially to bring, uh, to bring, you know, one of the friends that he's made in the U S into Canada, uh, because I mean, Canada and the U S are so similar in so many ways. I mean, we speak mostly the same language. We speak a little bit more of the Queens English and spell things a little bit differently here, but, but, um, we're so similar, but we're also different in, in other weird ways, like, you know, bagged milk and there's, there's, there's candy bars that we have here in Canada that don't exist in the States. And, and other and other elements, strange elements like that that are, that are just subtle. Uh, we celebrate Thanksgiving uh, in October, whereas in the U.S. it's in in November. So I think I think I can have a little bit of fun with fish out of water, where Michael is the fish that understands it better. <laughs> so that could be again that could be um, because there's a lot of humor in in this series that could be uh, ripe for some some fun humor, and that may be more or less novella or short story, unless there's an overarching like a larger thing that brings him back to uh, Canada. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's only thanks to TikTok that I recently learned about bagged milk. So um, <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> you mentioned that you've written some nonfiction. You, you, you know, you're writing this series. When, when did you know that you wanted to write for publication? Did you always know it? Did it come later in life? No, when I was a kid, I, I knew uh, my dream was to to write for publication. I wanted to to write to have people buy my stories and read them. Uh, so probably from the age of fifteen, um, the nonfiction stuff came almost accidentally. Like the nonfiction ghost story books that I wrote came from being in a, a meeting in the book industry and hearing this publisher, a, a vice president, a publisher say, "We've always wanted to publish." Um, ghost stories about Hamilton, Ontario. And I had recently gone on a ghost walk with the haunted uh, Hamilton uh, ghost walk group. And I said to them, I was like, wow, your stories are so good. You should write a book. And they said, well, we'd we'd be interested in it, but we've never, you know, we don't have the time, but, you know, we'd be willing to give you access to our stuff if you want to write one. And then around the same time, I heard that VP say, we've we've always wanted to publish a book like this. So I went, oh, I'm going to pitch the publisher, a book of ghost stories about Hamilton, because they've wanted to do one. And these guys have these great material, but they don't want to write it. Uh, and so I fell into that. And then even when I left uh, the corporate you know, business side of publishing, I, I've been a book industry representative since 1992. I, I still am, but on a part-time basis, because I left my full-time corporate role in 2017, at the end of 2017. Um, but I wanted to help other writers based on my 30 years of, of industry knowledge. And so I started writing nonfiction books to help other writers understand the business of writing and publishing. And now I, I just, I was working on, um, one of my books that's coming out later this year uh, with a co-author. And I realized I'm like, Oh my God, I've written six books. This will be the seventh one, like co-authored with somebody on nonfiction book on the, on the business of writing. So yeah, it's kind of funny how those things almost happen by accident. Yeah, that's really cool. Time for the last break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be wrapping things up with Mark. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Mark Leslie. I know that writing can be a, a difficult process in many ways, but uh, do you have a favorite aspect of the writing process? I think my favorite aspect of the writing process is the, I mean, when I'm in the zone and I'm just um, imagining and creating the story and everything's flowing and the characters are all interacting with one another, and it almost feels like I'm watching something really fun. Now, I, I know what's going to happen. Sometimes the things things occur that I didn't actually expect when I first sat down, but they kind of came organically. When I when I can get into the flow with writing, that is a phenomenal aspect. I think the other thing from having written, so that's the aspect of actually writing. The The thing I love the most about having written is when a reader reaches out to let me know that a character I created or a scene or a moment or a story or a, whatever it was, that that actually had an impact on them. Whether it entertained them, amused them, reminded them of some someone they loved or something that had happened, those to me are, are the most wonderful things um, about being a writer because you know, we're, writing is basically connecting two people here. The writer and the reader are, are connected at a moment in time when those words are being exchanged in the imagination. And and that is so ultimately powerful. When I hear from readers uh, that, that something moved them, like that is um, one of the reasons you realize you do this. I, I have no choice. I have to tell stories. But it's so cool when somebody else... Uh, has picked up that story and 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 it worked for them. It it was it was the right match. That is that is a, a wonderful magic that can happen. So that dance between writer and reader that just flows so naturally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Uh, obviously, you've written or co-authored six books on the writing industry, the publishing industry. But um, can you give maybe a condensed version of your advice to authors <laughs> that's not six books long? Yeah, I think that the, some of the, the biggest advice I can give to an author is do not give up on yourself. If if you have a dream to write, then uh, don't let anything stop you from pursuing that dream. It is a lot of work. It is not easy. I'm not going to tell you that it's easy to, to write and get published or to self-publish or any of those things, because no matter which way you do it, it's a significant amount of blood, sweat, and tears. But if it's something you truly believe in, keep working at your craft. Uh, as I say, Patience, practice, and persistence are one of the three keys of publishing success. You keep writing, you write, you work hard, you get better at your craft, and and you're patient because um, it can take a long time. Whether you're traditional publishing or or even self-publishing, you know, getting those sales, getting those readers can take a long time. I started the Canadian Werewolf in New York in 2006. I didn't finish it and publish it until 2016 after you know, finishing 2014 and working with an editor and then getting it out there myself in 2016. Um, I mean, that's a significant amount of time. That's a 10 years. So um, if you're if you're struggling and you're frustrated and things aren't going your way, just remember that this is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. When you take time to read for yourself, not for research or anything like that, uh, do you have your favorite go-to authors or genres? Yeah, so uh, authors who I will buy on site, any book that they release, I will just buy and read and love. Uh, they include uh, they include Michael Connolly, uh, his mysteries, thrillers, uh, anything he writes, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy, read, and love. Stephen King, except I'm not a fan of his fantasy, like the Dark Tower stuff, but anything else, yeah, anything he writes, I will I will read. There are uh, Canadian authors among that. Uh, Robert J. Sawyer, Canadian science fiction writer. There's not a book he hasn't written that I haven't loved. Uh, Sean Costello, another Canadian thriller uh, author. And and they're too, too numerous uh, to mention. Linwood Barclay is another uh, Canadian thriller author whose stuff I absolutely adore. But yeah, I, I think I could, I could probably talk for the next 24 hours about the books uh, that I've just read in the last couple of years that I've loved. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it, for me, but, but, but for me, I mean, the, the, such a, the books are such a central part of my life and always have been. So uh, those are just some of my uh, writers that I, that I love to pick up and, and just enjoy what they're doing. 
Thank you. And there is a train going through, so I'm going to wait till it stops. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I think it's a little quieter now. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of social media presence, do you have a website? Where can people find you on, um, or in, in, in terms of internet presence, do you have a website? Where can people find you on social media, et cetera? Well, uh, you can find me uh, on many social medias. Uh, if you go to marklesley.ca, that's my website. You can find out more than you even want to know about me. There's links to all of my social media because I'm on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and Twitter. And and, I, and I'm out there uh, quite regularly. And uh, on my website are links to all my social media as well as um where I'm going to be as as an author and also as an industry person, including a link to this wonderful recording that we're doing right now. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for all of all the places people can find you. Mark, we've talked about a, a variety of different things today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would especially like to bring up about this series or writing in general? Anything we haven't talked about? Uh, I I think um, I think the thing that I, I just want to talk, and this is more uh, in lines of potentially it's advice for authors, is uh, this series. So Canadian Werewolf in New York came out in 2016. Uh, then I started the series last year, 2020, and I realized that you know some work I needed to do to to make it into a series. And uh, four was that four years later, um, the book is selling better than ever before because it resonated with the right readers. And and I think that's the joy and thrill of what we can do as writers is there's so many different possible readers out there. And there's an old phrase that um, Bay Used Books in Sudbury, Ontario, uh, where I grew up, had. And they had a stamp they would put on the inside of their books. And they said, a book you haven't read is a new book. So it doesn't have to be the latest bestseller. It doesn't have to be a newer book. You can always pick up a book that was written ages ago. Think about the, um, there's that Netflix TV show, uh, The Queen's Gambit, uh, mm -hmm. that was hugely popular last year. And yep. that was based on a book that was originally published in the 70s or the 80s or something like that. <laughs> it was new to all of us suddenly. Right. Uh, and, that, and that's a really important thing for writers to remember, but even for readers, because readers can go back and go, oh my God, this author who's published stuff in, in whatever, 1970 or 80 or whatever, oh my God, they're so great. Uh, and, and that's something that we often forget because we're all, always only thinking about the next thing and not realizing all of the amazing things that exist and have existed. The classics uh, even are, um, are there to explore and love. Absolutely. And for me personally, I love when I find a, a new to me author that has already written a bunch of books in a series because then I don't have to wait for the next one to come out. I can I can binge them. Uh, so I absolutely exactly. love finding new to me authors. Yeah, that that is a, a real thrill because you're like, oh, my God, I can binge this. Yes. Yes. And you mentioned um, Stephen King's fantasy that you're not a fan of the Dark Tower, but um, I'm the opposite. I, I prefer his fantasy to his horror. And I thankfully came across the Dark Tower when he was almost done writing them. So I did not have to wait 30 years like a lot of people did. <laughs> oh, that yeah, that's a that's a big challenge. That's why I avoided it initially, because I didn't want to start something that might never finish. Exactly. Exactly. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about um, the Canadian Werewolf series. And, and um, I love Michael as a, as a character. He's just so much fun to read. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Sarah. As always, it is a pleasure. Thank you once again to Mark for joining me to talk about an American, sorry, a Canadian werewolf in New York, excuse me, and the um, the series, the Canadian werewolf series. This has introduced me to what might be my favorite wolf shifter ever, just because I like how sweet and kind he is. He is as a human. So uh, that's just me. But thank you to Mark. And if you are a fan of 
fantasy, urban fantasy in particular, of wolf shifter stories, then you should definitely check out not only this book, but the whole series. And you can find those um, on Mark's website, as he was mentioning, and order them wherever you order books. I hope you will join me next time when I'll be speaking with Seth Mullins about the authors of this dream, which is the first in his series of books, uh, The excuse me, Edge of the Known, which chronicles the um, the life of a band by that same name, The Edge of the Known. So join me for that. Please, as always, if you're a fan of this podcast, uh, follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can find us there. Find, well, the podcast and me, I guess. I guess that's the us. I don't know. The royal we something. Interact with me. I'd love to hear from you. What are you reading? What do you like to read? What do you want to read more of? What do you have in your TBR list? Is your TBR list going to fall over and uh, bury you in a pile of books some days? I'd love to hear it. And also, if you could give this podcast a nice review, whether that's written or a starred review, that is incredibly helpful. And I thank you in advance if you choose to do that. Thank you to Mark. Thank you to you. I hope that your day is going very well. And regardless of what that day involves, I hope it involves lots and lots of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.